I want to share with you a message that I call what happens when you worship. What happens when you worship? And you may not know this. This is going to mess with your mind. Do you know that you need to worship every day? You ought to worship God every day. In fact, the Bible is full of uh, commandments, exhortations for you and I to worship God. Psalms 95, 6 and 7. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Hallelujah, Jesus. Father, I just pray right now that you'd anoint me, God, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that today this would not be me, but it would be you sharing this word. And I pray for the people who are listening to this word, God, that they would receive it with spiritual ears, Lord. Not just to be received with their mind, but received with their heart so that it changes all of us, so that we are shaped more into the image of Jesus, so that our lives truly do worship you, God, in everything we are and do, Lord. I announce it, God, in the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, what is worship anyway? A lot of people think of worship as like that period of time during church where we sing songs and we say things to God and we raise our hands and all that kind of stuff. And and that's sort of a just a period during the worship service, right? And, and we can call that praise and worship, and that's fine. But that's not really what worship is. Worship is when an individual exalts God to the highest place in their life. And you do that by acknowledging who he is and what he has done. When you exalt God to the highest place in your life. Listen, life is right When God is in his proper place in your life. Let me say that again. Life is right. I'm not saying the world is right. I'm not saying your situations are all perfect. I'm saying life is right. Between you and God and the way you handle everything else. When you've got God in his proper place in your life. And what is God's proper place? He's on the throne. I'm on my knees. He is the shepherd, I am the sheep. He is the king, I am his servant. He is the leader, I am the follower. Are you hearing me today? Amen. Notice what it says in the scripture. Come, let us worship. And what do we do when we worship? We bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. We are the people of his pasture, the sheep of his hand. This psalmist understands what worship is. Worship is when we exalt God, everything else gets lowered in our lives, including our own selves. Amen. There have been times in my life when I've been so into the presence of God that I just couldn't help but fall down on my knees and worship him. Come on. Now, you don't have to be on your knees to worship God, but sometimes the spirit is just so great and his holiness is so grand that you are humbled by it and you end up on your knees. And then there are times when I've been so in the presence of God, my knees wasn't low enough and I had to just lay flat on the ground. How many of you ever worshiped God flat on the ground before? That God just messed you up and he just dropped you straight to the ground. Worship is when God is exalted to the highest place in our lives. You see, when God is put in his proper place, then life is as it should be. But you know what? There's always things that are vying for your worship. There are things in life that want you to worship them. There are things in your life that want to take that place in your life. They want to be exalted in your heart and in your mind and in your life. And those things are called idols. And if we're not careful, those things get exalted in our lives. And when they do, our lives get out of whack. You see, without worship, what happens to us is slowly and unnoticeably, God starts getting lowered and other things start getting exalted in our lives. And it isn't long until our lives get out of whack and and everything is out of sorts and it seems like it's chaos in our lives. How many of you know what I mean? Like you've got all these things uh, screaming at you and and you've got decisions to make and problems to face and difficulties and, and, and you're worried about what the doctor says and what the banker says and you're worried about all this other stuff because you've allowed it to get elevated in your life above God. Come on, say amen or owe me today. We've got to watch this today for it says in Romans 1 25 for they exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator. Come on. 
And he led him up. I'm reading Luke 4, 5 through 8. Led him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. How many of you know what's going on in the scripture? The devil is tempting Jesus. And he led Jesus up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, I will give you all of this in its glory, for it has been handed over to me. And I give it to whomever I wish. Therefore, if you worship before me, it shall all be yours. But Jesus said this, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Praise God. There are things, there are beings trying to get you to exalt them over God. You know, Satan would love for you to exalt him over God. But, you know, most people aren't going to be like Satan worshipers, go to the church of Satan. So he sneaks in other little things in your life to get you to worship. He just wants to get your worship off of God because he don't want your life right. And so he gets you to worship other things. One of the things that we can find ourselves worshiping is other people. Now you're thinking, I don't worship other people. But listen, when you live to please others... When you live for the approval of what other people say, you're exalting them in your life. Come on. After decades of serving God, I have learned this. I don't care what you think about me if God is pleased with me. Come on, somebody. I've got one person I'm trying to get his approval of, and that is God Almighty. Amen. You may not realize it, but when you live to approve others, you're exalting them to a place that belongs to God. It's God's place. And you got to get over what other people are saying about you. Some of you have lived, can I just get in your kitchen now? Some of you have lived long enough worrying about what other people say about you. You're so concerned that you are listening to everything they say. You're trying to change your opinion constantly. You get your mindset going one direction, then you hear somebody say something and you make a sharp left turn because you don't want somebody mad at you or upset with you. Let me tell you how to get over people. Stop worrying about what they think or what they say. They're going to talk about you anyway. Come on. If they talked about Jesus, they're going to talk about you. Stop trying to fit in. The Bible says you are a peculiar, strange people. The world's way is going this way. God's way is going that way. You're not supposed to look like everybody else. Come on. Stop trying to fit in. Stop letting the opinions of other people dictate how you live your life. Can I tell you something? Other people are wrong a whole lot. (laughs) Yeah, other people told me what I should do and who I should marry. There are people told me and Kathy we, we wouldn't make it. Uh, it's just not going to work out. And May 3rd, we had our 38th anniversary. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes, God help me, sometimes people are stupid. Come on. They got the spirit of stupid. <laughs> and, and sometimes we don't know enough to know that we don't know enough. And so we don't close our mouth. We just say what we say. Sometimes I have an opinion, but I'm, I'm smart enough to say, you know what? I really don't know what I'm talking about. I ought to shut up. <laughs> Come on. I think that's a spirit of wisdom right there. You got to get over what other people think, because if you don't, what happens is you start exalting their opinion above God's. And when God is telling you go, which oftentimes God will tell you to do things that don't make any sense. And while people are over here trying to make sense of your life, God is over here saying, just trust me, just go, just follow where I will tell you to go. And everything is going to work out. But you've got to believe me more than you believe them. You've got to trust me more than you trust them. When we exalt God in his proper place, then others. Other people's opinions start to get lowered and they don't matter to us anymore. Come on. You got to stop worshiping your your other people and you got to stop worshiping yourself. This is where we really have a problem because I like to please me. (laughs) I like to please me. I like I like to get my desires filled. I like to eat ice cream whenever I want. (laughs) I like to sleep whenever I want. I like to do what I like to spend money however I want to do it. I like to please me. But if you've lived very long at all like that, you know that that will leave you in a giant mess. When you are the Lord of your life, your desires are exalted and God becomes your servant in your mind. You ever know those Christians that they just go around deciding how everything's supposed to turn out and then they pray that God will make it turn out? I want to have this car. God, give me this car. 
You know, I want to have this wife. God, give me this wife. Or, or I want to have this kind of big church. God, give me this. Or I want to have this kind of a job. God, give me this. And they've just decided how everything's supposed to be. And they haven't ever even asked God what his opinion is on the matter. God may not want you to have that woman. She might be a disaster. <laughs> she might be. God may not want you to have that job. He's probably got a better one for you. Are you hearing me today? But when you start worshiping yourself, you start living in the flesh and your desires get exalted. And what happens is you start seeing God as the one who can make your dreams come true. Listen, God doesn't exist for you. You exist for God. You need to remind yourself, God is God and I am not. Amen. When you worship yourself, it is your power that's at work and God has to sit on the sidelines. You know, uh, God's power doesn't work outside of his will. God's power doesn't work outside of his will. If it ain't his will, his power ain't going to be in it. Come on. But what happens is we get these desires. We want things our way. And when God don't make them our way, we try to make them our way ourselves. We try to force everything to happen our way. It's like a, a grown a parent who's got grown kids and you just trying to make them do what you think they should do. And the more you push, the less they do what you want them to do. Is there a witness in the building? Come on. And are you ever going to figure out that you can't make things happen because you're not God? Come on. You can't make things change like you want them to change. And, and so you try, you try your might, you try your wisdom, you try your effort. And God is over there with his arms folded going, yeah, I see, I see. You want it your way and you want to make it happen. And look what's going on. Nothing's going on. Have you ever tried to make it go your way so long that you start to get really frustrated? You get mad at other people. You get mad at God, you get mad at yourself, you get mad at your boss, you get mad at your wife, you get mad at everybody. Now you're frustrated, angry, worried, even fearful. This is what happens when you start letting your flesh decide that it's greater than God, that what you want is bigger than God. You know, it's not always an easy thing to get on your knees like Jesus did and say, Father, not my will, but thine be done, because that opens the doors to things that you may not want. Come on. Oh, but if you know God and if you have God in your sight, if you're looking upon God and you've got him exalted, what you know is God is the God who loves you, who sees things you don't see, who has your best interest at heart. And that if you trust him, he will give you better than you even want for yourself. Come on. Come on. We worship ourselves. And what happens is, is our life gets all out of sorts. We've allowed someone besides God to sit on the throne of our lives. Listen, you got to get over yourself. You got to get over other people and you got to get over yourself. And what I mean by that is tell yourself things don't have to turn out my way. I know you think things have to turn out your way. God has to send me a paycheck or some kind of money so I can make my car payment. He has to do it. But do you know many people have had their car repossessed? And then you know what happens when your car gets repossessed? You get another one. And you live on and it ain't as bad as you thought it was and, and maybe you'll end up with a better car than you had the first time now I'm not saying it's a good thing that you got your car repossessed I'm just saying sometimes you let got to let God decide how things are gonna turn out mm hmm you got to say you know what God whatever you want to do is okay with me you want to know the secret to real peace it's not that God fixes everything how you want it it's that you become okay with however God wants it to be come on what if you just said however it turns out if I live 15 years or 50 years or 100 years it's all right with me if you want me to be rich I'll be rich God if you want me to be poor I'll be poor God if you want me this or you want me that if you want me to live in Austin or Cedar Park whatever you want God is okay with me what if you were okay with what God did in your life what peace would you have things don't have to turn out your way you want to get over yourself you don't have to be the hero now, let me tell you what I mean by that sometimes we want we want things to go the way we say they should go that way we can say yeah I knew that was gonna happen or we can say I told y'all it was gonna be this way how many of you like that feeling like you were right <laughs> I told y'all I told y'all that guy was going to be the president. I told y'all this was going to happen. We like that. And sometimes we want to be the hero. And, you know, I remember one time I was just kind of conversing with God. And I, I said to the Lord, Lord, if you just, 
if you just give me money, I would bless people. You know me, God. I don't even have a lot of money now, and I still bless people with money. And I know y'all do too. And you ever thought to yourself, man, God, if you just give me millions of dollars, I'd just... People could just come to me and I would just bless people. I'd buy this one a car and I'd take care of that one's bill. I'd do that. And, and you know what God said to me? He said, that's because you want to be the hero. You want them to look to you as their provider. You're exalting yourself over me. You want to rob them of their experiences that help them learn to trust in God. You want them to trust in you. I'm not your hero today. God's your hero You hearing me today? You don't need to be the hero. And listen, you don't know best. I know you think you do, but you don't know best. God knows best. He sees things you can't see. Come on. He knows things you don't know. And if you trust him, if you believe in him, if you have faith in him, you can let go and let God. Come on, somebody. To get over yourself, you have to decide that you on the throne is a bad idea. Come on. Can I tell you something? I got more respect for the ancient civilizations that took a rock and carved an idol and worshipped it than I do for the modern day person who decides they're going to be the God of their own life. Because at least they're smart enough to know, it. surely this ain't me. Those people thousands of years ago at least knew, hey, it can't be me that's in charge of all this. There's got to be something out there that's smarter than me, better than me, bigger than me. Something beyond me has to be in control of all of this. you got to realize that you can't even get your life in order. How are you going to get the world in order? Come on. You on the throne is a mess because you're in a place you don't belong. What happens slowly You don't even notice as you just go through life and all of a sudden other people and even your own desires start to get exalted. And it's like it. You don't even recognize it happening until you reach a place where everything is just out of whack. Everything is out of control. Chaos takes over in your life. And 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 you realize at some point that God isn't first place in your life, that he's not sitting on the throne of your life. And that's what got everything messed up within your life. Oh, but when we worship God, come on, when we worship. Worship God. Are you hearing me today? What happens when we worship God is God gets exalted back where he belongs. Hallelujah. God gets exalted back where he belongs. Glory to his name. His will is exalted. There's been times in my life where I knelt to pray and I had the intention of telling God what I wanted. But before I got through worshiping God, I decided I was going to let God tell me what he wanted. Hallelujah. I was going to say, you know what, God, not my will, but thine be done. Hallelujah. That's a beautiful place to be. God's will gets exalted. You stop caring about your desires. You stop thinking about other people's opinions. You stop worrying about which way the world is going. And you start thinking about what God wants in your life. Or when you begin to worship God, his way is exalted. God gets to do it however he wants to do it. I remember one of the first times in ministry, somebody came up to me and gave me $50. And I didn't want to take it. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me and he said, Mylon, if you want me to provide for you, you don't get to tell me how I do it. So now when you offer me money, I will take it from you. Very rarely do I not take it from you. Because I know two things. God gets to provide for me however he wants to. And number two, when you give, you're blessed. Amen. I don't want to rob you of a blessing. Come on. Hallelujah. Now, a lot of people think that's crazy. But listen, I believe the voice of the Lord. I believe that you got to trust that God's going to do it his way. Amen. Not your way. Oh, well, God, I'd like for it to happen like this. I'd like for it to turn out this way, and I want you to get there this way. And, boy, we have our own opinion and our own mind, but if we just let go and know that God's ways are above your ways, and his thoughts are above your thoughts, and he sees things you don't see, and if you just worship him and get in his presence, you'd say, God, just do it however you want to do it. Do it whenever you want to do it. God, I'm going to let you be in control. When you worship God, his word is exalted. You know, it's easy when you get out of worship and you hadn't been in the presence of the Lord, you hadn't been exalting God. What happens is his word gets distant and faint in your mind. You hearing me? What happens is the opinion of the world starts to get bigger and bigger. Have you noticed that when you're not in God's presence, you hate more? People irritate you more? You start listening to the voice of the world, the world's opinion about social issues and and life and religion and 
and all of this stuff. If you're not in the presence of the Lord, then the word of God gets smaller to you. Because, listen, there are many people who read the Bible and get not a stinking thing out of it. You know why? Because they don't have the spirit to enliven it. You need the spirit to enliven it. It is not intellectually received. It's spiritually received. And so that's why there's a little old farmer who can barely read the words who knows more about God than the professor teaching theology at some college out there because he receives it by the spirit. Amen. When you're in the presence of God, the word becomes real to you. You start to get revelation. You see the word as it really is. When you exalt God, the lies of the devil get smaller and the truth of God's word gets bigger. All of a sudden, when you worship God, the doctor's report gets smaller and God's promise of healing gets bigger. Come on, somebody. Yes, and the worries and the bills get smaller and God's promise that he would provide for you gets bigger and bigger. Hallelujah. Oh, and the enemy, the attacks get smaller and the promise that God would overcome every enemy in your life gets bigger and bigger. Oh, when we exalt the Lord, when we put God in his proper place, things turn out as they should. Our lives are as they should be. Now I want to give you a glimpse of true worship in Isaiah chapter six. If you want to go there and go through this with me. This is Isaiah and In verses 1 through 4, Isaiah 6, it says, In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. I saw the Lord. Let me just stop right there. Some of us need to see the Lord more. You know who who sees the Lord? People who are looking for him. I saw the Lord sitting in a chair. No, sitting on a throne. On a throne, lofty and exalted, with his train of his robe filling the temple. Angels stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the threshold tremble at the voice of him who called out while the temple was filling with smoke. What we have here is an example of somebody exalting the Lord. He said, when I see God, I see him exalted. Can I tell you something? When you see the Lord, you will never see him any other way than exalted. If you're really looking at God, you're looking up. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. God is exalted. Isaiah said, when I see the Lord, I see him exalted. Next in verse 5, everyone is put in their proper place. He says, then I said, woe is me, for I am ruined because I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. What does this mean? Isaiah has exalted the Lord. He's seen him exalted. And listen, when you see God exalted, it puts you in your proper place, on your knees, humble before the Lord, deciding you don't know it all, deciding that you need help. Hallelujah. Isaiah sees God exalted, then he sees himself for who he really is. He says, I am ruined because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I live among all of these other people of unclean lips. When you exalt God, God gets put in his place and everybody else does too. And next, verse 6 and 7, God becomes your only hope of salvation. It says, then one of the angels flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, behold, this has touched your lips and your iniquity is taken away and your sin is forgiven. I want you to notice Isaiah couldn't do a stinking thing to exalt himself at all. He couldn't do a thing to save himself. He couldn't do a thing to fix his situation. He realized that God was his salvation. When you exalt the Lord, what you realize is that you need Jesus. I need Jesus. Hallelujah. I still need Jesus, everybody. I still need Jesus. Hallelujah. Sometimes I get to walking in my own spirit, my own uh, flesh, and my own self, and I start thinking I'm pretty good, and I got this all together. I can even start looking around at other people and being judgmental, but when I get in the presence of God, all of a sudden to my knees, I realize I'm a man of unclean lips, and woe is me, I live among a people who are unclean, and I need Jesus. I still need Jesus today. Hallelujah. Next, the worship continues in a life of service. 
Verse 8, then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Can I tell you who the people who are the called, the people who are willing to go, they're the people who've been in the presence of God. They're the people who have worshipped God so much that he's the only one on the throne and everything else has fallen short and they're willing to say, God, whatever price I got to pay, wherever I got to go, whatever I got to do, God, I'm going to do it, send me. That comes because we've been standing in the presence of the Lord. Oh, yes, Isaiah exalted the Lord. He was put in his proper place along with everything else. He recognized God as his Savior, and then he said, God, I'm not just going to worship you with my lips. I'm going to worship you with my life. I'm going to head out into the world and I'm going to do what you say. Worship doesn't end when the church service ends. Worship doesn't end when the music doesn't end. Worship doesn't end because there's more to come. Worship is more than a song. Worship is more than words. Worship is obedience. Can you say the Lord? Praise the Lord today. Worship is I will obey the Lord. You need to worship God every day. You and I need to worship God every day. What does that mean today? That means you need to find time in every day of your life where you get your focus on God. Your focus on God. How many of you ever prayed without your focus on God? It's like God is kind of over here and you're just heading through life. Yeah, God, you know, I know. What's up, God? And you're like, you know, it'd be nice if you fixed this for me. And God's over here and it's like, it'd be great, you know, if you'd work that out. And hey, God, I love you. You know, I love you, Jesus. What's up? You know, um, this bump, whatever. And, and it's kind of like, it's kind of like God is in the periphery of our eyes instead of stopping and saying, I'm going to give you all my attention. You want to have a problem in your marriage? Give your wife partial attention all the time. Sometimes I'll be watching the game and I'm old. I can't hear like I used to. So I can't hear two of you at the same time. It's either, you know, Tony Romo or whatever and, and or, or you, honey. <laughs> and she'll talk and I'll say, wait a minute. Hold on. I got to find the remote and uh, pause the game or mute the volume or something so that I can focus my attention on what you got to say. And if I don't do that, she doesn't think I care about what she has to say. So I got to stop and focus my attention on her. Sometimes we got to stop and focus on God. You say, well, I'm really busy, Pastor. Oh, really? Shall we shall we examine how long you've been on Facebook this week? (laughs) How many TikTok videos did you scroll through? How much time did you spend watching your favorite television programs? How much time did you spend napping or, or talking to somebody else? Can you not take five minutes to stop and get your focus upon God? Worship starts with you stopping everything else and saying, I'm going to focus on God. And let me tell you what happens when you decide to do that. Everybody in the devil will come knocking at your door. Hey, let me get your attention. And if what you do is say, well, I'll take care of all of this other stuff, God, then I'm going to get to you. What will happen is you'll never get to God. You got to tell everybody. I got to spend some time worshiping my God. I'm focusing on the Lord right now. When you focus on the Lord, acknowledge who he is. Say to him, you are my God. You are my healer. You are the author and creator of life. You are the beginning and the end. In other words, you're trying to tell God that he's God. You're ascribing to God his nature. Say it to the Lord. Say it, God. You are my God. You are God. You are the one who's helped me and blessed me. Acknowledge who he is and acknowledge what he's done in your life. Oh, you saved me. You delivered me. You healed my body. Many times I've been broke, God, but you came through. Many times I've been without, but you fed me. Lord, I've never been without a roof over my head or a meal in my stomach, God. I've never had to do without, God, because you've always taken care of me. Acknowledge who he is and what he's done, and he starts to get bigger and bigger in your vision and higher and higher and more clear in your sight. Are you seeing what I'm telling you today? Are you getting this today? When you exalt God, he gets bigger in your heart. And then when you're in his presence and you're seated properly and you've got him seated properly on the throne of your life, that's when you know you've worshiped. You don't know you've worshiped just because you said the words. You don't know you've worshiped just because you sang the songs. You don't know you've worshiped until you've been in the presence of the Lord, until you have exalted him and you've been in his presence. You see, Jesus said in John 4, 23, the hour is coming and now is when true worshipers, that means there are false worshipers. 
True worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. What does that mean, spirit and in truth? It means that it can start with your mouth and with your hands, but at some point it's got to be in your spirit, where your spirit has exalted God. Where in your spirit you're looking at an exalted holy God, and it has humbled you, and it has affected you, and it has done something in you. Can I tell you, church, we need this experience on the daily, amen. We need to get into the presence of God so that it humbles us and exalts him so that our problems get small and our God gets big so that other people's voices don't matter anymore so that truth reigns in our lives what happens when you worship God is put in his rightful place in your life and everything and everyone else is put in their proper place as well chaos turns into order fear turns into faith confusion turns into clarity What was once a mess, God will straighten out if you simply worship him. When you leave today, you go home this week. I want you to practice the presence of God. I want you to take some time. If you need a song to get your mind in the right, that's fine. If you've got to get alone, that's fine. Whatever it takes, but get in that place where your focus is on the Lord. And he becomes so real and so big that you feel it in here. And he becomes so big and everything else starts to get really, really small. And just like the song we sang says, when you turn your eyes upon Jesus, the things of earth get strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. Hallelujah. Let me close with this thought. There were three crosses on Calvary's hill. Sometimes we can get our... Eyes focused upon the one on the left or the right. The one on one side was Christian. He gave his life to the Lord at the end. You could call him the saved because Jesus said, you'll be with me in paradise. The other one cursed Jesus, rejected him. You could call him the sinner. Sometimes we get so focused on what is in the right or to the left, we forget about the whole point of this thing. It's the man in the center. It's the guy in the center. It's Jesus. And when we get our focus on the man in the middle, then all the other things get put in their proper place. I know you got a doctor's report, and maybe it's not a good one. But if you get your eyes focused on the man in the middle, it will take its proper place. You won't be losing sleep over it all the time. I know you got bills to pay, and you don't know how you're going to do it. I know you got worries. And I'm not saying to be irresponsible. What I'm saying is if you exalt the Lord, he'll get big. His promises to you will get big and your worries will get smaller. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I want smaller worries and a bigger God. And if all I got to do is spend a little time in my daily life focused on God and exalting him, if that's all it takes, I'm in. Come on, say it with me. I'm in today. Hallelujah. Can we just take a moment to praise God today? Would you lift your hands and let's worship him together? Father, we praise your wonderful name.